Thank you for joining us. Shalom means peace. And ever since this show first went on the air, we hoped to see positive solutions implemented in all areas and for all people in the world, not only in the Middle East. While we see the maximum is being done right now to address the worldwide pandemic and economic crisis, there's also some tremendous news. We just witnessed the most historic milestone since President Sadat of Egypt visited Israel in 1977 and made peace. He and Prime Minister Begin received the Nobel Peace Prize, which they unquestionably deserved and earned. Since then, throughout the years, we've seen both Democrat and Republican administrations trying their best to broker more peace in the Middle East, in addition to promises to move the United States Embassy to Israel's capital, Jerusalem. They could have, but they never did. With all the lies and half-truths imposed upon us for decades, especially now, everyone should have the honesty to recognize promises made and promises kept. Actions do speak louder than words. Whether people like President Trump or not, what has he actually done? Shouldn't one have the courage and integrity to recognize the true facts, whether some people like it or not? Donald Trump is the most pro-Israel U.S. president since the Jewish state was founded in 1948. He recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and in fact did move the U.S. capital there. He withdrew from the Iranian nuclear deal, which was a threat to world peace and of course the region. Whether some people like it or not, he defunded the Palestinians' PLO due to their subsidizing terrorists' pay-to-slay jihad. He formally recognized Israel's sovereignty over the strategic Golan Heights, and in December 2019, Trump signed a groundbreaking executive order to protect Jewish students across America to enforce Title VI against discrimination, including anti-Semitism. No president in history has come close to being as dedicated and loyal a friend of the Jewish people or to Israel as this president. Whether some people like him or not, we should face the truth and we've just witnessed another incredible historic fact. The signing of peace between Israel, the UAE and Bahrain. This is immense and the biggest positive achievement in the Middle East in over 30 years. For anyone to try to undermine and belittle this immense achievement and call it just a distraction is astonishingly self-insulting and hypocritical. This phenomenal historic peace milestone is absolutely momentous, and no one says it better than Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in the White House. Play. Carry. Play. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, His Highness, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the United Arab Emirates, and the Minister of the Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Bahrain. We're here this afternoon to change the course of history. After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. Thanks to the great courage of the leaders of these three countries, we take a major stride toward a future in which people of all faiths and backgrounds live together in peace and prosperity. Our dear friend, President Trump, First Lady Melania Trump, thank you for hosting me, my wife Sarah, and our entire delegation on this historic day. I want to recognize Vice President Pence, Secretary Pompeo, National Security Advisor O'Brien, and other cabinet members, Jared Kushner, Avi Berkowitz, Ambassador Friedman, and other members of the President's Able Peace Team Senators, members of Congress, Israeli Ambassador Ron Dermer, his Emirate and Bahraini counterparts, as well as all the dignitaries, 
gathered here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, this day is a pivot of history. It heralds a new dawn of peace. For thousands of years, the Jewish people have prayed for peace. For decades, the Jewish state has prayed for peace. And this is why today we're filled with such profound gratitude. I am grateful to you, President Trump, for your decisive leadership. You have unequivocally stood by Israel's side. You have boldly confronted the tyrants of Tehran. You've proposed a realistic vision for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And you have successfully brokered the historic peace that we are signing today, a peace that has broad support in Israel, in America, in the Middle East, indeed in the entire world. I'm grateful to Crown Prince Muhammad bin Zayed of the United Arab Emirates and to you, Foreign Minister Abdullah bin Zayed. I thank you both for your wise leadership and for working with the United States and Israel to expand the circle of peace. I am grateful to King Hamad of Bahrain and to you, Foreign Minister Abdul Latif Al Zayani, for joining us, joining us in bringing hope to all the children of Abraham. To all of Israel's friends in the Middle East, those who are with us today and those who will join us tomorrow, I say, Assalamu Alaikum, peace unto thee, Shalom. And you have heard from the President that he is already lining up more and more countries. This is unimaginable a few years ago, but with resolve, determination, a fresh look at the way peace is done, this is being achieved. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the blessings of the peace we make today will be enormous. First, because this peace will eventually expand to include other Arab states, and ultimately, it can end the Arab-Israeli conflict once and for all. <laughs> Second, because the great economic benefits of our partnership will be felt throughout our region and they will reach every one of our citizens. And third, because this is not only a peace between leaders, it's a peace between peoples, Israelis, Emiratis, and Bahrainis. And I'm sure that together, we can find solutions to many of the problems that afflict our region and beyond. So despite the many challenges and hardships that we all face, Despite all that, let us pause for a moment to appreciate this remarkable day. Let us rise above any political divide. Let us put all cynicism aside. Let us feel on this day the pulse of history. For long after the pandemic is gone, the peace we make today will endure. Mr. President, distinguished guests, this week is Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and what a blessing we bring to this new year. A blessing of friendship, a blessing of hope, a blessing of peace. Thank you.
the Prime Minister of the State of Israel and His Highness, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the United Arab Emirates, will sign a treaty of peace, diplomatic relations, and full normalization. They will each sign three copies, one in English, Hebrew, and Arabic. We kindly ask that all guests remain seated for the signing of the documents. Alan, it's such a pleasure to have you back on the show, but what a very strange, momentous time in history this is with the peace accords and everything. It's a great time. Look, this has not been a good year generally for the world, but the peace accords between Israel and two Gulf states with the possibility of as many as seven or eight more Gulf states joining is a momentous event, not only in Israeli history, not only in the Middle East, but for world peace. And the people who have brought it about should get enormous credit for it. The President of the United States, uh, Jared Kushner, Avi Berkowitz, the people who've worked hard, the emirs of the two countries, uh, should be given enormous credit. And I hope they will be by history. I was reflecting on life and the historic developments we're witnessing at this time, promoting peace and positive solutions for all people. And producing this show for decades now has been actually my life's work. And now as well, in this increasingly anti-Semitic and fragmented world, George Orwell would be horrified to see the reality of people today in the United States being persecuted and ostracized, vilified, even murdered, if they don't express the views others insist that they do. This frightful deterioration of freedom of thought and the vast hypocrisy and selective outrage and lies by omission are all an absolute nightmare. You were indisputably recognized as the foremost advocate for Israel in the World Court of Public Opinion and the most famous defense attorney in the world. You've written numerous books like this one, A Case for Israel, in addition to upholding law in general and interpreting the Constitution. How do you see the significance of the historic peace accords just signed at the White House? Well, it's very different. Uh, the past peace agreements brought about peace between warring countries. Um, Jordan killed many Israelis when they attacked in 1967. Egypt killed thousands of Israelis during the Yom Kippur War. So those uh, peace agreements ended uh, years of uh, bloodshed. But the normalization process uh, was not complete. There still is no real normalization between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Jordan. Normalization between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain will be a warmer, a warmer peace because those countries have so much to gain from Israel. Israel deserves enormous credit for bringing this about because it's made itself indispensable in the Middle East. It's science and technology, it's military prowess, it's economic stability. Make it clear to these uh, Gulf states that uh, having an alliance with Israel is much more important. This is rather amazing. And this event that just occurred in this strange year of crisis, pandemic, economic crisis, all of a sudden we have this amazingly good news, yet some people belittle it and call it just a mere distraction. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's not a mere distraction. It's extraordinarily important. And when you get people like Ben Rhodes or um, others who were in the Obama administration uh, poo-pooing it, um, it just shows jealousy that the President Trump was able to accomplish what President Obama was not able to accomplish. Or people like Peter Beinart, who ridiculously don't even want a two-state solution. He wants uh, a one-state solution where the state would become an Arab Muslim state with the Jewish people having a little homeland within the state, a kind of ghetto, a shtetl. Uh, um, that's not the future. The future is a strong Israel, a powerful Israel, an Israel that lives under the principles of the Psalms, which say, Hashem oz, God will give the Jewish people strength and only then will they get peace. Uh, Israel has learned the lesson that peace comes through strength, not through weakness. 
and Peter Beinhart and others would weaken Israel. And the important thing is to strengthen Israel. Israel got this peace with these Arab countries through its strength, not through its weakness. And it must continue to increase its strength, its qualitative military superiority over all the Arab and Muslim nations surrounding it. And then it will have the confidence to make peace even with belligerent countries. Alan, is this not a fact that has occurred this year that everyone should be celebrating regardless of their political affiliations? Not only should everyone in the United States, regardless of whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, celebrate this and give credit what credit is due, but the Palestinians should celebrate it. The Arabs in the world should celebrate it. It helps the Arabs. It will help ultimately the Palestinians. But one thing we can't do is let foreign policy become anything but bipartisan. Everybody who supports Israel, which means most members of Congress, with the exception of the squad, the extreme, extreme left-wing elements of the Democratic Party should be applauding it. And Vice President Biden and uh, Senator uh, Kamala Harris, they did applaud it uh, to their credit. You know, for me, bipartisanism means you support a president you voted against. I voted for Hillary Clinton. I did not support Donald Trump when he ran for president. But I praise him when he does the right thing, when he brought the capital to Jerusalem, when he recognized the sovereignty of the Golan Heights, when he brought about this peace process between Israel and the Gulf nations, two Gulf nations. I applaud him. And it also means you condemn the president you voted for. I voted for Barack Obama when he does a terrible thing like the uh, Iran deal, which basically was a green light to Iran to develop a nuclear arsenal. And I'm glad that President Trump uh, took a much tougher stand uh, in relation to Iran and continues to impose sanctions. So to be a bipartisan means you praise good things and you condemn bad things, regardless of which party it comes from. And you actually are described as a hero who stands by what he believes in, and you've been vilified and criticized for being honest. That's true. I mean, I've lost a lot of friends when I stood up on the floor of the Senate. A great honor for me to do that, to argue against the impeachment of President Trump because the House did not impeach him on constitutionally permissible grounds. I lost a lot of friends. Uh, some of my relatives uh, attacked me and criticized me. I'm very proud. Of, of what I did. I stood up for the Constitution. And now we have some Democrats saying that they're going to try to impeach the president again for simply trying to nominate a justice to replace Justice Ginsburg. And while we're talking about Justice Ginsburg, I've known her for many, many, many years. I first met her when she was a professor at Rutgers University and a staff lawyer for the American Civil Liberties Union on whose board I served. Uh, we talked about our mothers. There's so much disinformation, and to my surprise, more than ever do we see this, lies by omission and so forth. And you've written so many books, but I'm glad you've also started creating your own podcast, The Dirsch Show. Please tell us about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I love doing it. It's like a law school seminar. Every morning I get up and I uh, read the news and then I get on the air and I talk about uh, issues in the news and also hypothetical. Then I take questions on any subject at all and I respond. I try to be bipartisan. I try to do an analysis of what's going on. Obviously, in the last few days, I've spent a lot of time on the Supreme Court and potential nominations and the confirmation process. But whatever the news is, legal, constitutional, political, Israel, Middle East, anything, um, you can hear my views on The Dirt Show. You can get it on uh, Spotify, Apple, or any platform on which uh, podcasts are broadcast. We'll put it on the screen for people just to be able to access it easily. And uh, I love speaking with you, of course, again, as we are today, <laughs> this way, because of the pandemic, by remote. I want to thank you enormously for your participation and your insight. Thank you, sir. It's an honor. It's always a pleasure to be on with you because you always ask such intelligent questions. Thank you, sir. Joining us now is Mark Goldman. Mark, it's such a pleasure to have you back on the show, especially during these momentous days. Well, thank you very much for having me, Richard. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you. How do you see the significance of these peace accords? Well, it's clearly beyond historic. And I think one of the things that we should recognize is that 
if these two, uh, not just two, but if these places which have had such a long history of enmity are able to accomplish what they have accomplished already, it just shows what is possible for the rest of the world if we work at it. This is all incredible news. In fact, I remember when Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt, visited Israel. It was such a heady, amazing time. And now, after all of these years, we are again witnessing something of similar, equal importance. I think even greater in the sense that it has perhaps greater worldwide ramifications. And I think it's helping to clarify because among other things, of course, uh, Iran's behavior has led to some of this and Iran has been the personification of evil that, and, and everyone is recognizing it. By the way, I'd like to mention that we did invite a prominent member of the Democratic Party, a very well-known individual who had to decline in the last minute. And uh, it's okay because basically the purpose of this conversation today is to promote the subject of peace and the peace accords. That's what this is about. While we celebrate this incredible event, the Abram Accords and all that it signifies, another thing going on is the unrest in the United States, which is really quite horrific. Not the summer of love in Portland, as someone said. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are that we have enemies who are deliberately inciting all of this in their efforts to create as much destruction to the United States. The first thing that I think all of us need to think about is imagine a world without America. America is what has stood up for freedom and to any extent that freedom exists in the world, it's because of America and we cannot afford to lose America. And that's what the other side wants to do because if there's no America, then they can take over. That certainly is very interesting and a fact that people should be aware of. But our show today is about the historic peace accords. Let's continue on that. Well, I mean, I think that they certainly uh, represent a complete 180 degree shift in the attitude of those uh, Arab Muslim countries towards Israel and uh, it's a harbinger of further active uh, engagement with Israel and recognition of Israel as a part of that part of the world. Yes, absolutely. And there are more peace treaties on the way, we are told. And the future can look very positive. Before we conclude, give our audience a final message, Mark. Well, I think that the audience, that all of us need to be looking at what the danger is if we let the other side uh, win. What they have done is crossed off some of our fundamental rules for behavior in a civilized society. We can't start crossing off commandments. Our battle that's taking place is between God or no God, rules of living or no rules. So you oppose the fact that uh, recently at a certain convention the words under God were omitted? They want to replace under God with under government. And when you're under government, the rules change every single day to suit whoever is in charge at that point. We cannot afford to let that happen. Under God, we know what the rules are and all we have to do is act accordingly and we'll have good civilized behavior and everybody will work things out. All we can do is hope for the very best and see what the future holds for all of us and all good people on earth. I want to thank you very much for being with us, Mark. We each have to do our part to make sure that happens and I want to thank you very much, Richard, for, letting, for having me on. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Holt Kramer founder and president of Trump at USA. This is the most important election of our lifetime. No question about it. We are going to determine right away on this election whether we are going to be America, stay America, be the land of opportunity, or whether we are going to take a socialist, horrible turn in our life. Now, you know, President Trump, as you well know, 
has done more for the Jewish people and the Jewish community than any other president we have had. In just less than four years, he has made what everyone said could never be done, peace in the Middle East. And whether you like him or whether you don't, you don't vote an election. Something as important as this on whether you like somebody, you decide who can do the best job, who can make the world better for you, your family, and the rest of the community in our life. Well, let me tell you this. President Trump has been wonderful to the Jewish people. And I know there have been people saying, oh, this, oh, that. Well, let me just give you a very quick synopsis. First of all, President Trump's daughter Ivanka and son-in-law Jared are Jewish. Not only are they Jewish, they're Orthodox Jewish. And as a matter of fact, they keep a kosher household and the president has a kosher kitchen at Mar-a-Lago. And the children are being raised in the Jewish religion. Now, let's get to some other stuff. Who is going to bring the economy back really strongly and quickly? Certainly not going to be Joe Biden. We're leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> Got fired. In 48 years, can you name one thing that he did successfully? I don't think so. Not one that is memorable. Maybe some that's in the news right now, duh. We're interested in keeping America, America, and making sure that she's strong and her people have jobs. If Joe Biden gets in, I believe that we will be heading for a depression. That, what does that man know? He's been a career politician. He is not a businessman. Carmela is not a businesswoman. They are politicians. Politicians work for politicians. Uh, they don't have the experience. We know we have to think about the vaccine. Do you think anyone's gonna push as hard for a cure for this pandemic? You can count on the president. He is the man who is going to be there for you. And don't forget law and order, because right now law and order and Antifa is destroying our country and they will continue to destroy our country. So you just think about this, think about it. You're not gonna call Antifa in the middle of the night if you need help, but you sure as heck are gonna call the police. The disrespect they have suffered is shameful. Listen, I don't care how you feel, whether you think President Trump says things that you don't like or whether you, th whatever you think. This is the only person in this world today that can make this country whole again and heal it. Stay with Trump, vote, tell your friends, your family, everybody you know. And remember, peace in the Middle East and more to come.